Okay, welcome to tutorial 9. In this tutorial, we're going to introduce the chi-square test and talk about different ways that we can measure the direction and strength of the association between two categorical variables, including the relative difference, number needed to treat, relative risk, and the odds ratio. So far in the course, we've mostly talked about bivariable analysis when an explanatory variable is categorical and the outcome is numeric. So we've discussed the paired t-test, the two-sample t-test, one-way ANOVA, and the non-parametric alternatives to these tests. Now we'll talk about tests when both the outcome and explanatory variables are categorical. If two non-matched or independent groups are being compared on a categorical outcome, we ideally want to conduct a chi-square test. But if our assumptions for the chi-square test aren't met, then we conduct the non-parametric alternative, which is the Fisher's exact test. If we have two dependent or paired groups for our explanatory variable and our outcome is categorical, we use McNamara's test. We won't learn much about the details of McNamara's test in this course, but the main thing you need to know is that you should use it in this situation. So let's first talk about the chi-square test. As I mentioned, this is the parametric test used when there are two independent groups in a categorical explanatory variable being compared with a categorical outcome. The chi-squared test of independence is a parametric test for testing if two qualitative variables are independent of each other or dependent on each other. The question we want to ask here is, is the outcome or y variable independent of or dependent on the explanatory or x variable. The null hypothesis is that the explanatory and outcome variables are independent. In other words, that there is no association between x and y. The alternative hypothesis is that the explanatory and outcome variable are dependent, that x and y are associated. As usual, we start by assuming that the null hypothesis is true and then work out a probability that tells us how likely we were to observe what we did in our sample or something more extreme, given that the null hypothesis really is true. So we want to know how different what we observed in our sample is from what we would expect to observe in our sample if the null hypothesis really were true, if the two variables really were independent. Here's the basic formula. We calculate a chi-square statistic by subtracting what we expect to observe in our sample from what we actually observe for each of our cells, square this and divide it by what we expect to observe, and then sum these values for each of the cells together. The chi-square statistic follows a chi-square distribution with a degrees of freedom equal to the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. This statistic tells us how far an observed value is from what's expected for it in terms of standard errors. The larger the chi-square statistic gets, the more evidence we have that the two variables may not be independent. An important thing to know is that the chi-square test is similar to ANOVA in that it will tell you whether two variables are dependent but will not tell you the direction or magnitude of the association, only whether or not the variables are dependent. To calculate the chi-square statistic, we first need to understand what marginal and conditional distributions are. Let's first look at an example contingency table, our observed 2 by 2 table, where the x variable is vaccination status and the outcome is autism status. The separate total or overall distribution for each of these two variables are shown in the margins of the contingency table, which is why they're called marginal distributions. So for example, the column on the far right shows the marginal distribution for vaccination status. So approximately 440,000 people or 82% of the sample was vaccinated while 96,000 or 18% were not. We can also look at the marginal distribution for the autism variable. This shows us that over 99% of the 537,000 people do not have autism, while 0.137% do. 
do have autism. The rows and columns of the tables that are inside the table, not in the margins, show what are known as conditional distributions. So for example, the first row of the table shows us the distribution of autism status conditioned on having been vaccinated. This is also shown in greater detail by the relative frequency and relative percent in the table on the bottom. So of those who had been vaccinated, 0.14% had autism, while 99.9% .9 did not. We can also look at the conditional distribution for the autism variable conditioned on not being vaccinated. So among those who were not vaccinated, 0.121% had autism, while 99.9% .9 did not. Similarly, we can look at the first column inside the table to see the conditional distribution for the vaccinated variable, conditioned on having autism. So among those who had autism, 84% had been vaccinated, while 16% had not. And finally, in the second column, we can look at the conditional distribution for the vaccinated variable, conditioned on not having autism. Of those who did not have autism, 82% had been vaccinated, while 18% had not. So as I mentioned, with the chi-square test, we start by assuming that the null hypothesis is true, that there's no association between X and Y, and then work out a probability that tells us how likely we were to observe what we did in our sample, or something more extreme, given that the null hypothesis really is true. So we want to know how different what we observed in our sample is from what we would expect to observe in our sample, if the null hypothesis really were true, that the two variables really were independent. So we've already talked about the observed contingency table, but in order to calculate our chi-squared statistic, we also need to determine what we would expect this table to look like if the two variables really were independent or not associated, assuming that the marginal distributions did not change. That is, if 440,655 people were vaccinated and 96,648 were not, if 738 were autistic and 536,565 were not. The formula for calculating each of the four cells for our expected table is the row total multiplied by the column total divided by the overall total. So if our marginal distributions were the same as our original or observed table, we use this formula to determine that we would expect 605.25 people to have been vaccinated and have autism if vaccination status and autism status were not related. This is calculated by multiplying the row total by the column total and dividing by the overall total. We follow the same process for each of the four cells to calculate the expected values for our table. With the chi-square test, we're wondering how different the values are for our observed table from what we would expect these to be if X and Y were not associated. So our next step is to quantify how different what we observed is from what we would expect to observe if X and Y were not related in standard units. For each of the four cells, we subtract the expected cell values from the observed, square this and divide it by our expected cell value. We add these all together to get our chi-square statistic. The larger the test statistic gets, the more evidence we have that the two variables may not be independent. We can also calculate a p-value associated with our chi-square statistic, which tells us if the two variables really are independent, then how likely we were to observe a difference in what was observed and what was expected as large or larger by chance alone. We get this p-value in our output in R, and so here we see that the p-value is 0.139. So our conclusion based on this test is that since our p-value is larger than the significance level of 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis 
and conclude that we do not have enough evidence to claim that the vaccination is a risk factor for autism. So everything that we've talked about regarding hypothesis testing so far in the course applies here. We have not proven that the two variables are independent or not associated. We have failed to provide enough evidence to believe that they are dependent on each other or associated. So as I mentioned, the chi-square test allows us to conclude that either we don't have evidence to believe that the two variables are dependent, or we have evidence to believe that they are dependent on each other. There is an association between the two variables. But the chi-square test gives no indication of the direction or strength of the association. So if, for example, we got a p-value below 0.05 with the test we just conducted, we didn't, but just for the sake of example, say that we did, we could state that we have evidence to believe that there's an association between being vaccinated and autism. But based on our chi-square test statistic and p-value alone, we don't know if being vaccinated increases or decreases the likelihood of autism, and we don't know how much the likelihood of autism is increased or decreased by being vaccinated. So this is similar to ANOVA, which wouldn't allow us to quantify which groups differ from which or by how much. Like all other parametric tests that we've talked about so far in this course, the chi-square test has some assumptions that must be met. We didn't check these with our previous example, but we should have before proceeding with the chi-square test. And if they weren't met, we should use the Fisher's exact test. The assumptions of the chi-square test are that observations were collected from a simple random sample and are independent. So each individual appears in only one cell of the table. All observed cell counts are at least one, and all expected cell counts must be at least five. It's usually safe to assume that these latter two assumptions have been met if the data set is large. But you can always check this last assumption by calculating the expected cell counts. And also, R will give you a warning if the expected cell counts are too low. If these assumptions are not met, then we should conduct a Fisher's exact test. And as previously mentioned, if the individuals are paired in some way, then the chi-square test is not appropriate. So for paired data, we should use McNamara's test. So we talked about how the chi-square statistic will tell you whether two variables are dependent, but will not tell you the direction and strength of the association. To determine the direction and strength of the association, we need to calculate statistics like the risk difference, relative risk, or odds ratio. The risk difference is also known as the risk reduction, rate difference, and attributable risk. The relative risk is also known as the risk ratio and rate ratio. There's some debate about when it's appropriate to use these alternative terms for risk difference and relative risk, but for the sake of this course, you can assume that these mean the same thing. So we're now going to turn to how we calculate these different measures. Constructing a two by two table as a first step will help you to figure out which numbers to use to calculate the risk difference, relative risk, and the odds ratio. I'm sure you're well familiar with this at this point, but this is how we construct a two by two table. So our Y variable is on the top with yes to the outcome, often a disease or condition on the left and no on the right. Our explanatory variable is on the side with yes to the exposure on the top and no on the bottom. We calculate statistics like the risk difference, relative risk, and odds ratio based on the values within the cells of the 2x2 two two table for our observed data. We can simplify this table by labeling each of the four cells inside our table as A, B, C, and D. A are people who have the outcome or condition and were exposed. B are people who don't have the outcome and were exposed. C are people who have the outcome but have not been exposed. And D are people who do not have the outcome but have been exposed. You'll often see a lot of simplified formulas for relative risk and odds ratios using A, B, C, or D. But the problem is that a lot of the time you're not given information about the study sample 
in a neat two by two table where the information is presented as A, B, C, and D. Or you might have a two by two table where not having the outcome is shown in the column on the left and having the outcome is shown on the right. Another example is if the Y variable is presented in the rows rather than the columns. So in these kinds of cases, using the formulas for measures of association based on A, B, C, and D will not work. So it's really important to know what the calculated probabilities used in the formulas actually mean rather than just remembering the letters. But if it's possible, you'll always want to put your information in a table of this format. And once we have our two by two table, we then figure out our marginal and conditional distributions for our variables in the table based on the available information. So first let's talk about the risk difference. This tells us the excess risk for the outcome associated with being exposed. The formula for the risk difference includes two conditional probabilities. It's the probability of having the disease given that you're exposed minus the probability of having the disease given that you are not exposed. The confidence interval for the risk difference tells us that we can be 95% confident that the excess risk associated with being exposed is between the lower and upper limit. And this follows the same general formula that we've learned so far in the course of the risk difference estimate plus and minus Z times the standard error. Here's an example of how we would calculate this if our outcome was child obesity and our explanatory variable was mother's smoking status. The hat is on top of the risk difference calculated from our example to show that this is a sample estimate and not the true population risk difference. So the probability of obesity given that the mother smoked minus the probability of obesity given that the mother did not smoke is 0.124. And so this tells us that 124 per 1000 incident cases of childhood obesity can be attributed to the mother smoking. The number needed to treat is related to the risk difference. This is the number of people that would need to move from the exposed to unexposed in order to prevent one case of the disease or condition. The number needed to treat is the reciprocal of the risk difference, so 1 divided by the risk difference. And the confidence interval limits for the number needed to treat are the reciprocal of the values for the confidence interval limits for the risk difference. An example interpretation is that 8.06 mothers would need to not smoke during pregnancy to have one less case of child obesity. But because you can't have 0 0.06 of a mother, we round this up to nine. So we would say that nine mothers would need to not smoke during pregnancy to have one less case of child obesity. The relative risk is the ratio of the risk of the condition or disease for exposed individuals relative to the risk of unexposed individuals. And this value is dependent on the prevalence of a condition. So you should not calculate the relative risk if the prevalence in the sample does not reflect the prevalence in the population. So for example, if you have a case control study where you're selecting a group of people with the condition and matching them to a group of people without the condition, the prevalence of the condition in your sample does not reflect the prevalence in the population. So you should not calculate relative risk with a case control study where the prevalence of the disease is determined by the researcher or any instance when the prevalence in your sample does not reflect the prevalence in the population. The formula for the relative risk is the probability of disease given that you're exposed divided by the probability of disease given that you're not exposed or A over A plus B divided by C over C plus D if you have your table arranged properly. If the relative risk is greater than one, this tells us that those who have been exposed have a greater likelihood of the disease than those who have not been exposed. If the relative risk is less than one, this suggests that those who've been exposed have a lower likelihood of the disease. If the relative risk is equal to one, 
This suggests that the exposed and unexposed are equally as likely to have the disease. The confidence interval for relative risk is slightly different to other confidence interval formulas that we've covered so far in the course. For this, you take the log of the relative risk plus or minus z times the standard error of the logged relative risk. The reason why we use the log of the relative risk for our confidence interval calculations is because the sampling distribution of the logged relative risk follows a normal distribution, but the sampling distribution of the relative risk does not. So after we've calculated the upper and lower limits, we exponentiate these to get the upper and lower limits for our confidence interval for the relative risk. And we can also use this confidence interval as a test of significance for the association between x and y. If our confidence interval does not include 1, this tells us that our exposure and outcome are significantly associated. The relative risk in our example tells us that the probability or risk of obesity for a child whose mother smoked during pregnancy is 6.57 times the probability or risk of obesity for a child whose mother did not smoke during pregnancy. In other words, a child born to a mother who smoked during pregnancy is 6.5 times as likely to be obese than a child born to a mother who did not smoke during pregnancy. Based on our confidence interval, we can say that we are 95% confident that the true population relative risk is between 2.4 to 18. In other words, we are 95% confident that a child born to a mother who smoked during pregnancy is between 2.4 and 18 times as likely to be obese than a child born to a mother who did not smoke during pregnancy. This interval does not include 1, so this tells us that we have evidence to believe that the risk of obesity for the exposed group is significantly larger than the risk of the unexposed group. If this interval did include 1, this would indicate that we do not have evidence to believe that the risk of obesity for the two groups is significantly different. This is because a relative risk of 1 indicates that the risk of obesity is equal across the two groups. So if 1 was included in our interval, we wouldn't be able to reject the null hypothesis that there was no difference between the two groups. The odds ratio is the ratio of the odds of the condition for exposed individuals relative to the odds of the condition for unexposed individuals. The odds ratio is more flexible than the relative risk. So you can calculate this even if the prevalence of the disease in your sample does not reflect the prevalence of the condition in the population like a case control study. So you can always use an odds ratio for a case control study instead of the relative risk. The formula to calculate an odds ratio is the odds of disease given that you're exposed divided by the odds of disease given that you're not exposed. And this is actually mathematically equivalent to the ratio of the odds of exposure given that you have the disease divided by the odds of the exposure given that you do not have the disease. So this is why we can calculate the odds ratio with a case control study. Even if we select people on disease status, and therefore our prevalence in our sample is not reflective of the prevalence in the population, we can still calculate the odds ratio. And when the disease is rare, so meaning the prevalence in the population, not the sample, is very small, the odds ratio approximates the risk ratio. The confidence interval calculation is similar to the confidence interval calculation for the relative risk. You take the natural log of the odds ratio plus and minus z times the logged standard error and then take the exponent of this interval. And this is because the logged odds ratio follows a normal distribution while the unlogged odds ratio does not. So the odds ratio is similar to the relative risk in that if it's greater than 1, this suggests a positive association. If it's less than 1, this suggests a negative association. And if it equals 1, this suggests no association. In this example, the odds of an individual whose mother smoked during pregnancy being obese is 7.52 times the odds of an individual whose mother did not smoke during pregnancy being obese. If this were a case control study, 
we would interpret this as the odds of an obese individual having a mother who smoked is 7.52 times the odds of a non-obese individual having a mother who smoked during pregnancy. So odds ratios aren't as straightforward to interpret as relative risks, but their strength is that odds ratios are flexible and can be estimated even when the prevalence in the sample does not reflect the prevalence in the population. And odds ratios are also used a lot in statistical modeling. So for example, in SPPH 500, you'll learn about logistic regression, which is an extension of what we're learning here and is used to estimate odds ratios. So based on our confidence interval here, we can say that we are 95% confident that the true population odds ratio is between 2.5 to 22.8. In other words, we are 95% confident that the odds of a child born to a mother who smoked during pregnancy being obese is between 2.5 to 22.8 times the odds of a child born to a mother who did not smoke during pregnancy. As with the relative risk, this interval does not include one. So this tells us that we have evidence to believe that the odds of obesity for the exposed group is significantly larger than the odds of the unexposed group. So note that calculating our confidence interval will give us the same conclusion regarding statistical significance as our chi-squared test, but it will also allow us to determine the direction, magnitude, and range of possible values for this association. So let's try an example problem. In a study of women entering the New York State prison system, 475 randomly selected inmates were cross-classified with respect to HIV seropositivity and their histories of injection drug use. The data are shown below. Among women who have injected drugs, what proportion are HIV positive? Among women who have not injected drugs, what proportion are HIV positive? How can we graphically display the data? At the 0.05 significance level, conduct a hypothesis test to determine whether there is an association between injection drug use and HIV seropositivity. Estimate the relative odds of being HIV positive for women who have injected drugs versus those who have not. So for parts A and B, we were asked to calculate our conditional probabilities. We determined that among women who have injected drugs, 44.9% are HIV positive. Among women who have not injected drugs, 8% are HIV positive. How would we graphically display the data? Using a mosaic plot allows us to visualize the table. If there's a perfect cross in our plot, this suggests independence or that injection drug use and HIV are not associated. We don't see that here, which suggests that these variables may be associated. The next question was, at the 0.05 significance level, conduct a hypothesis test to determine whether there's an association between injection drug use and HIV seropositivity. Given that our outcome is categorical, so yes, HIV or no HIV, and our explanatory variable is also categorical, so injection drug use, yes versus no, the appropriate parametric test is a chi-squared test. The null hypothesis is that injection drug use and HIV serostatus are independent, and the alternative hypothesis is that injection drug use and HIV serostatus are dependent or associated. But before we can conduct the chi-squared test, we have to make sure that our data meets the necessary assumptions. We know from the study design that this is a simple random sample and that each individual appears in only one cell of the table. So the first two assumptions are met. All of the observed cell counts are at least one. So we can see that information in our table, but we also know that this is likely true because of the large sample size. And we also know from the large sample size that we can assume that all expected cell counts contain at least five. But you could also double check this by calculating the expected cell counts to make sure that they all contain at least five. So since our assumptions are met, we can proceed with conducting a chi-squared test in R. So if we look at our output, we can see that the p-value associated with our chi-square statistic is extremely small, 0.0. 
so it's essentially zero. Since our p-value is less than 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that we have evidence to believe that injection drug use is associated with HIV serostatus. But notice that based on the output of this test alone, we don't know the direction or magnitude of the association between injection drug use and HIV status. So we don't know whether they are positively or negatively associated, and we don't know how strong this association is. In order to find out how these variables are associated, we need to estimate a measure of association like the odds ratio. Or we could calculate the relative risk if we can assume that the prevalence in the sample reflects the prevalence in the population. The next part of the question asked us to estimate the relative odds, or the odds ratio, of being HIV positive for women who have injected drugs versus those who have not. We can do this in R if we download and install the FER package. So Mike has a YouTube video that shows you how to install packages in R like the FER package. We use the FE2 by 2 command to get the odds ratio and tell R that this is a cross-sectional study. The output gives us other estimates like the prevalence ratio, which is another name for the relative risk with a cross-sectional study like this one. But this question was about the odds ratio. So we run this code and find that the odds ratio is 9.34. So this can be interpreted as the odds of being HIV positive among women who have injected drugs is 9.34 times the odds of being HIV positive among women who have not injected drugs. So the next questions are, interpret the 95% confidence interval reported for the odds ratio, and what if you instead wanted to report on the odds of being HIV positive among women who have not injected drugs compared to those who have? How would this change the odds ratio, confidence interval, and p-value? In other words, the group of interest is now women who have not injected drugs, and the reference group becomes women who have injected drugs, which is the opposite of what we looked at originally. So based on our confidence interval, our interpretation would be, we are 95% confident that the odds of being HIV positive among women who have injected drugs is between 5.4 and 16.4 times the odds of being HIV positive among women who have not injected drugs. Or we are 95% confident that the true population odds ratio is between 5.4 and 16.4. The second question was to report on the odds of being HIV positive among women who have not injected drugs compared to those who have. How would the odds ratio, confidence interval, and p-value change? Whenever you want to switch the groups being compared, you can either change the reference group in R, or you can simply take the reciprocal of the originally calculated odds ratio, which you'll recall was 9.3. This tells us that the odds of being HIV positive among women who have not injected drugs is 0.11 times the odds of being HIV positive among women who have injected drugs. And the same is true of the confidence interval. We simply calculate the reciprocal of our original confidence interval, and our confidence interval can be interpreted as we are 95% confident that the odds of being HIV positive among women who have not injected drugs is between 0.06 and 0.19 times the odds of being HIV positive among women who have injected drugs. But our p-value will not change. This is because the p-value is derived from our chi-square test of independence, which only tells us whether or not we have evidence to suggest that injection drug use and HIV are significantly associated. While the odds ratio changes when we change the assigned reference group, the p-value doesn't change because it's still an indication of how dependent or independent the groups are. And this does not change when you switch which group is being compared to the other. Let's try another example. A researcher was concerned about the level of knowledge possessed by university students regarding basic mathematics across different departments. 32 students were randomly and independently sampled and completed a standardized math exam. 
the major of students was also recorded. Assume students can only have one major and that there are four majors. Determine whether there is a difference in average math score across the different majors. So our null hypothesis is that there's no difference in math scores between the majors. The alternative hypothesis is that the math score of at least one of the majors will be different. So the outcome is math score, which is a quantitative variable, and the explanatory variable is qualitative with four levels. In this situation, the appropriate parametric test is one-way ANOVA, but we must make sure that our data meets the assumptions for this test. Based on the study design, we know that the groups are independent, as students can only have one major. If we look at the distribution for the groups, we can see that the data in each group is approximately normally distributed. The edges of the boxes, so the interquartile range, and the whiskers, so the outer 50% of the different groups, are approximately symmetric around the medians. And we can also see here that the standard deviations of the math scores for the four majors are approximately equal. The largest standard deviation of 20.9 is not more than double the smallest standard deviation of 17.1. So we meet the equal variance assumption here. So we meet all of our necessary assumptions for one-way ANOVA. We conduct one-way ANOVA in R and find that the p-value associated with our F statistic is 0.981. Since our p-value is greater than our significance level, we fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that we do not have enough evidence to believe that at least one of the groups is different. We won't do this here because our test was not significant, but if it was, the next step would be to conduct a test of multiple comparisons with an adjusted significance level, so like Bonferroni's or Tukey's test. And this would allow us to determine which of the majors are significantly different from other majors. So I'm just going to conclude today's session by talking about some R commands that might be useful to you. The first is if you want to export output to a text file to save to review later including by providing a path for this file. The second is the epi tools package for categorical variables. Using the epi tab function gives you a two by two table with marginal distributions and an odds ratio with lower and upper limits. And this is helpful because it makes it more clear which groups are being compared. You can also tell R which value should be used in each of the four cells using the matrix command, and then calculate an odds ratio or risk ratio. So this shows the results for a risk ratio or relative risk. And then finally, here's a flexible command that allows you to recode your variables. In our next tutorial, we'll introduce Pearson's correlation and simple linear regression. We'll also go over how to interpret linear regression output and how to check assumptions, and we'll discuss the coefficient of determination.